And we're back. Welcome back to the greatest show broadcasting from Bottom Earth Television here for you, for all of you. Alice welcomes you. Colleague welcomes you. Eagle Eye. I saw somebody talk say it was evil. There's no evil around here. No, it's eagle eggs. Eagle laying the fruit. He has a lot of fruit to lay, let me tell you. We have a lot of fruit to spray. How do you like them apples? <laughs> Hope you guys are ready for a jam-packed episode. We are going to be bringing you the truth, pulling the curtain back from the Matrix. Today is the day to celebrate, to rejoice, for you're going to be fed the formula. We're coming in hot, just like a fajita. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, there's a lot of stuff on the tab today. (laughs) Colleague is loaded. Alice has prepared it all. Eagle Eye has double-checked it. And I have smoked it. (laughs) Excellent. (laughs) It is. He is one with the tab. I have a lot on my tab also. We are going to be talking about things that we were talking about last week that came to fruition this week. Now, to you guys, it may not seem that way. Because what you watched this week's episode, 056, was actually recorded last week, but you get to see it this week. So there are some correlated collusions that have been proven to be evidently true that we'll talk about today. And I have no clue what's on my colleague's tab. Colleague is got a jam-packed tab. I, Like I said, I have no clue what's on it. He never lets me know. Alice doesn't give me an update on his tab. So, hope you guys are ready for the experience. Probably for good reason. <laughs> blow your socks on. It's going to blow you straight away. Yeah, it'll blow you clean away. Yeah. But before we get started, we got to flush the royal, majestic, mm. A-L-I-C-E toilet, mm. bottom earth, the bell shall ring, here in three, two, one... Welcome to Toilet Time TV, your source for the truth, shattering the illusions of the Matrix. Just like the dome. (laughs) Shattering through the firmament, letting the water spray all over us. I hope you guys are wet. But before we get into some of these more complex conceptualized ideas that may have been connected to the collusions from last session. We'd like to start with something to ease our palate. Colleague, take it away. Apparently, uh, on June 8th this year, New York City, they had a vending machine for drugs. And you guys probably heard about it. Um, They had uh, crack pipes in it. Um, They had lip balm. They had condoms. Uh, They had anti-overdose meds. um, And all kinds of fancy doodads and doodads. So you're saying this was just like a legit, normal candy bar vending machine, like push B6, put $3 in kind of vending machine? It's been there, but... It ran low. It ran out of stock, literally overnight. So I believe it was stocked on June 6th or 7th, and then it was uh, uh, cleaned out by June 8th. One user, Evelyn Williams, told the New York Post while standing at the public health vending machine in Brownsville, Brooklyn, on Tuesday. She said, yes, I love it. They put it in yesterday, and it's empty already. What is the city going to do? Is the city going to help maintain access and funding for this high-demand vending machine? Is there only one? As far as we know, yeah. Um, She said, we have a lot of addicts, this same Evelyn Williams. She said, we have a lot of addicts, so they should restock it immediately. You know, if there's like fresh, unused syringes, then, you know, that's probably a good thing. Because you know, that probably mitigates diseases that get transmitted from using, you know, each other's needles and stuff. So that actually may not be a bad 
thing. It's one vending machine right now. Um, but <clears throat> yeah, it's those things flying like hot cakes. Yeah, I mean, you could do utilize that now that I'm thinking about it, not in more satire sense, but on a legitimate sense. There could be some real utility with that, with like, for example, just needles. I mean, a lot of people share needles, and there's a lot of people who contract diseases because of that. And you can mitigate that if needles were easily accessible. Yeah, but see, I see that that's where it gets dangerous. That's that's um, that's not going to be healthy, and we don't we don't want to condone the use of needles here. And I don't think New York does either. Well, I uh, you can't stop what people want. Whatever people want to do, they're going to do. And I, it, it's better than people ending up dead because they're sharing needles. Yeah, but I, I think you know we we're trying to be healthy. And I think New York is trying to be healthy. So what, you think we should just throw them all in jail? No, we just need to keep needles out of it. Yeah, but how are you going to stop people from using the needle? <clears throat> well, one self-described crack smoker, Minoshi Kalpe, uh, walked away with the second-to-last product in the vending machine, a fentanyl test strip. There's a lot. So I guess, yeah, the people are get, being interviewed at this vending machine. We could go on and on. Uh, there's videos and uh, pictures of people punching in their orders and getting their fix on Route 66. Now, is this vending machine issued by the state? Because if it's free, yeah, okay, and the state is doing that, then it's exactly what I was thinking. Then it's doing that on the sake of trying to provide safe, uncontaminated utility or tools for participating in these kind of activities and that makes sense i i really do understand that because you can't stop people from doing what they want to do but at least you can try to mitigate some of the redundancy of problems because ultimately who's going to pay for it so let's say that you start sharing needles these people ain't got no health insurance and they have to go to the hospital i like the acronym you posed clean uncontaminated tools cut so we just cut out the contaminated tools, which would be syringes and needles. And that's it. Everything else is doable. The plastic pipes are free. The glass ones. Um, of course, now we need to make sure that the the glass on the container itself, on the vending machine, is clean and up to par so people don't get diseases from that. But other than that, I mean, maybe a hand sanitizer bottle or something. Well, anyways, that's interesting. I, I don't really know what to make out of it. Well, what I was reading this week, on a different note, is something I was talking about last week. I thought it was extremely ironic last week when Yellen was testifying before Congress, and one of the senators asked, or one of the House representatives, I think she was in the House representative, one of the representatives asked her, do you think that the dollar's power or utility is becoming diminished on a worldwide scale? And her response to me was shocking because she knows the demand for universal trade has to be on a stable, tradable currency. And that's what the dollar is. Very minimal float. Doesn't change its price much. And that's what you need. That's what creates a stable, tradable economy. But Yellen's response was, it is a natural thing to see a diversity within reserve assets in a growing global economy. That makes absolutely no sense. That's like saying, uh, yeah, we all know we like to trade on the stable currency so that we can buy and sell stuff and know exactly what we're going to pay for it. But because we're growing as a nation, we decide we want to start putting more high-floated or variable currencies into our reserve assets. What are you going to do with these reserve assets? Uh, well, it's just there. Why? Oh, we just need them. For what? You're not going to trade with them because they're too variable. You th that you're going to make an agreement on the ruble, and today it's worth this much, but tomorrow it could be dropped this much. How are you going to make any trade when it's variable that much? You're not. So you can't use international trade with variable currency. 
That's why you need a stable. That's why the dollar is so powerful. But she made the assessment that that's what you should naturally expect in a gl- growing, diversified global economy. Absolutely insane. So I assumed what this could allude to is that the IMF and the World Bank is making some kind of digital platform where they could initialize a stable coin or a stable currency or reserve currency to replace the dollar. Because if she's alluding the dollar is not going to really be needed in the future, which is insane, you need something to replace that dollar. And so that's what, that was my conclusion. The only reason she's saying this is to get people acclimated to the idea the dollar is not going to be the reserve currency in the future. Well, I just thought it was ironic that literally three days ago, June 19th, Router is reported that the IMF is working on a global central bank digital currency platform for all countries to participate under. Isn't that insane and ironic? Yes. Uh, (laughs) To me, it's absolutely insane. You have our treasury secretary, the one whose job is to defend the power of the dollar, saying, well, you know, it's normal that the dollar's not not globally a a majority. It needs to be diversified. And then literally a week later, you hear the IMF saying, yeah, and we're going to have something that could replace that dollar. Absolutely insane. But it'll stabilize it. No, because think about it. It, I mean, this is real simple. You don't have to be an economist or any of that. This is really simple. If the dollar is what everybody uses to trade because you can bet tomorrow the dollar is going to be worth about the same much value as it was today. That's why you use it, right? If there was an, and that's why all countries use the dollar. If there was another platform, another place where you could globally, all countries could trade, but you don't need the dollar as that stable currency, you could buy this IMF coin and that will be the stable currency. What incentive does any of these countries have to keep holding the dollar? None. That's right. That's what's gangster. That's insane. So what the IMF is imposing literally three days ago is they're creating right now. Wait, three days ago as of? Today, which today is June 22nd. It was June 19th. Ten days ago. No, that, I reported my conspiracy 10 days ago. But yeah. literally yeah. five days later, the IMF affirms my conspiracy. And I'm reporting today on the 22nd what was reported on the 19th which is the IMF said verbally, and Routers is reporting, they are currently working with, they are working with multiple platforms. They're working with Amazon. They're working with the Bank of Japan. They're working with the Bank of Italy. They're working with multiple banks to create this digital currency platform. And if this platform gets initialized, like I just explained, there is no real incentive for countries to keep the dollar. Now think about it. The reason why the dollar has so much power right now is because all countries have to hold this dollar. If all these countries have this new platform where they don't need a dollar, what do you think they're going to do the next day? Sell it. And buy what? This IMF IMF. coin. Immediately when they sell their dollars so they could buy this IMF coin, what do you think is going to happen to the U.S. dollar? It's going to have an IFM. An indeterminate future manifestation moment. Yeah, it's going to have a dump. A D-U-M-P. <laughs> <laughs> What's that stand for? Dump. Stand. <laughs> <laughs> it's insane because this is real now. This is all real. This isn't hyperbole. It wasn't just, it was my conspiracy about 10 days ago. <laughs> but now it's real. Totally well, it's, it's shocking a, to me. It's a conspiracy still, but the government like it, it was a conspiracy theory ten days ago, but now it's a conspiracy. Now it's a con- it's a conspiring agenda that's legitimized. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's coming to flourishion, and they're verbalizing it. They're Legitimize me, Captain. It. And it's absolutely insane because that means there is a real plan to get rid of the dollar. Because you know we talked about bricks before, and we talked about all these things because it was. In the spotlight, but the reality is nobody can take the replacement of the dollar stability. The dollar is strong. It's not going anywhere. 
That's why every country has it. But the IMF has the ability to mitigate that. Now, some of you guys may not know this little hidden thing about the IMF. The IMF is ruled by 24 governing bodies. But if you go to the United States Treasury's website, it will explain to you how these governing bodies work in the IMF. And the reason why is because if you look up who has the majority share, the majority shareholding of the IMF, it's the United States. The United States actually holds most of controlling power in the IMF. Now, isn't that interesting? The IMF could have a means to crash the dollar while at the same time holding all governmental control of the IMF stablecoin. So uh, and it's really strange. It could crash the dollar, but the same country that the dollar represents, the IMF is controlled by. So there is some real intertwined webs here. So you guys can see, you guys are seeing it right here. The treasury, this says it's specifically the United States, this is an official website of the United States. The treasury website clearly says that the United States has a majority shareholder in the International Monetary Fund. So there is some deep embedded collusion going on. And it seems like there is a high agenda to not to de-dollarize, but to say there's no reason for this reserve necessity for the dollar anymore. We can all just have this equal basis of our own individual currency, but we all have to buy the IMF coin. And so, hopefully you guys see where this is leading. Another thing that came out this week is Japan, which is, I think, the third largest economy in the world behind China and behind America. Here, it's reported that the Bank of Japan has completed a two-year Proof of concept research into the prospective central bank digital currency has now launched this initiative program. This makes Japan the largest democratic economy in the world to advance the stage of CBDC development. What was interesting to me is this IMF digital platform that they want to create. There was a white paper just written from the Monetary Authority of Singapore, and it was in collaboration with guess who? Who? No. No. I'm asking who. No. Amazon. So this is insane. So now we have the IMF, the Bank of Singapore, and it's also in collusion with the Bank of Italy and the Bank of Korea with Amazon to create with the IMF, this digital platform that all countries can utilize together for international trade. Now, what in the world is Amazon doing with this? They're going to be initializing probably the cloud system with their AWS system and possibly bandwidth and backbone. But they have this thing called the PMB protocol. And this PMB protocol, it says, is designed to work with different ledger technologies and forms of money and enable users to access digital money using wallet providers of their choice with a common protocol. The same infrastructure can be used across multiple use cases. Stakeholders using different wallet providers can transfer digital assets to one another. And so this is not Fugazi. This isn't hyperbole. The technology exists today. It can be accessible today. And the white paper is the technical paper. It's kind of like if somebody wrote a dissertation. So whenever you hear about a white paper, it's basically a company's dissertation on how their technology works. And so if anybody wants to read the white paper on it, it's written by the Monetary Authority of Singapore, and the protocol is called the PBM protocol. I'll probably talk about that in some future episodes, but it's happening now, and it's uh, coming to flourishing. So the future is now. Well, people have to see the, the idea of this global domination, 15-minute cities. Last week, we talked about smart cities and how that guy was using Amazon Alexa and he got locked out of his own house because they were saying he was using a racist, a racist slur. 
And before that, we talked about Smart Street and uh, State True. Yeah, well, yeah, BlackRock. Yeah, like, that's one thing I was going to continue talking about. Everybody's making a big brouhaha because BlackRock is now filing for a Bitcoin spot ETF. It's not a future ETF, it's a spot ETF. So it means a spot ETF means that BlackRock literally has to buy or some custody holder has to own these physical Bitcoins. It's not paper Bitcoin. So this is a big deal. But what I was thinking this is, see, because once this came out, Bitcoin price went through the roof again. It shot up. It was at a low. And as soon as this filing got initiated, Bitcoin's price went back up. But this ain't the first time somebody applied for a Bitcoin spot ETF. And every time they have been applied for, the SEC rejects it. I think this is just another pump and dump manipulation. Now, BlackRock has a reputation. I think they only have had one ETF filing that's been rejected. But I think this just is going to be the best way for a pump and dump because everybody assumes BlackRock's not going to get rejected. So everybody's going to start pumping all their money in. Because if this really goes through, that means BlackRock's going to buy a lot of Bitcoin. And the more they buy of Bitcoin, the price of Bitcoin is going to go up. So the idea is you better get in now. And you see what I'm saying? You can see how this is working. So you better get it now because BlackRock's going to guarantee Bitcoin to go through the roof. But what if the SEC rejects the filing? There's nothing BlackRock can do. And immediately, what do you think is going to happen? The Bitcoin price is going to tank. Because right now, who do you think is pumping up Bitcoin? It's BlackRock. Right now, BlackRock is buying Bitcoin. Bitcoin to artificially pump up the price so you can start getting into the hype and buy more Bitcoin because now you see the price going up. So your mind is thinking, oh, Bitcoin's going to go through the roof because BlackRock's going to make sure it happens because BlackRock, BlackRock's BlackRock. But all it takes is for the SEC to say denied. And before the SEC denies it, who do you think is going to know it's going to get denied? BlackRock. So who do you think is going to sell the Bitcoin before the denial? BlackRock. And then all of a sudden, a week before the approval comes out, you're going to see the Bitcoin price get dumped because BlackRock's going to sell it. But everybody's going to think, you're going to hear all the news say, this is a buying opportunity, guys. Look, this is your last chance to get in before Bitcoin goes to the roof. And and they, every- that's what they did already. And a lot of people got in and then it dumped. That's right. And But this is, this is going to be, the I think, one of the biggest pump and dumps ever because it's BlackRock. And so everybody's going to get in. I even think banks and institutions are going to get in. And then BlackRock is going to toilet on you. And so this is what I think is interesting. And the reason why I think this is correlated is because Bitcoin needs to get abrogated. Yeah, it needs to lose its validity so that these IMF digital currency platforms can say, see, we are trustable. You can't trust Bitcoin. You can't trust Ethereum. You can't trust none of it. We have to control this market yeah well the last thing i wanted to bring out concluding my whole premise here is yesterday jerome powell the federal reserve chair he was in front of congress testifying and he told they were asking him what do you think stable coins play as a form of money and powell makes it very clear he thinks that they are a form of money and they are important, and that they need to be regulated by the government. Um, we do see payment stable coins as a form of money, uh, and in all advanced economies, the ultimate source of credibility in money is the central bank, and we believe that uh, it would be appropriate to have a quite a robust federal role in, in what, what, what happens in stable coins going forward, and that leaving us with a weak role and allowing a lot of private money creation at the state level would be a mistake. So basically he's saying we shouldn't give the state the power to create money like that. That should be left to the federal government. And so I think it's interesting. He knows the power that's going on and he knows what's about to happen if the states get that power themselves. So anyways, this is big. It's going everywhere. The platforms are getting built. The idea of stable coins are being initialized. It's all happening right now. And I say within the next 18 months, you're going to see something insane. Insane. Pilot programs are going to come to an end. They're going to initialize actual CBDC functionability. And the beginning of the digital 
concentrational isolation is going to begin. And you guys are all will see what happens when you allow governments to be your religious dictator because they're the ones that are telling you what to do, when to do it, and you're giving them free access because you want some kind of nationalized convenience. There is a beauty of convenience in all of that, but at the same time, you lose your personal sovereignty because once everything goes digital, it's programmable. That's the hard thing, I think, for people to understand. This money is programmable. If they say, hey, hey, uh, host, we think you need to go on a diet. <clears throat> we are not going to allow you to buy XYZ food. All my allocated money is now on a digital wallet. All my money now is programmed to not able to buy certain foods. Hey, uh, colleague, we don't want you to buy coffee no more. You can't because your money won't transact coffee anymore. Yeah, I'll just have one of my friends buy it and I'll drink their coffee. Sure, sure. And so at some point, this is going to get widespread. But that's individual programming. What if it's regional programming? If you go outside of your state, your money doesn't work. Uh, think about Utah. It's like, we don't want you guys to buy alcohol anymore. And yeah, they wouldn't be able to. It's anything. You can, your money won't even work outside of your state. Your money won't work out of your country. Yeah. Your money won't work anywhere unless they say so. Your money's not going to work out of your hand. So this is the end result of allowing a government to have digital control over you. So anyways, I just want you guys to see this is happening now. This is not hyperbole. All those conspiracies are coming to flourishing. They are publicly announcing this is what's happening. So I just want you guys to be ready for it. We've been talking about this for over a year. And now we are seeing it. And it's only 12 months in. Another 12 months from now. And we're probably going to actually see utility at that point. So 2024. Let's see what happens. Honestly, I don't know how we are going to, I don't know if there's a way to stop this because now it's on a global scale. Like we're talking about the IMF and the World Bank and all countries are utilizing this. So it's something we're just going to have to prepare for. You guys tell us in the comments, what do you think we should do? And what do you think about Mussolini? It's a lot easier if it's isolated to a country, but if it goes to a global stance like the IMF, that gets really difficult. So tell us in the comments. What do we you are, think? We're calling out to the resistance. Yeah, tell us in the comments. Tell us what you think we should do as a nation, we should do as a people. The things that we talk about on here, it seems like it's a big conspiracy, but it's just simple pattern recognition. At some point, what people say, it, it means something. These guys are puppets, so they're being controlled by some string, and that string is premeditated. So it's not like... These things are arbitrary. Anyways, that's all I have on my tab. I'm interested to see what else is on colleagues. Let us know what Alice has brought to your low or high resolution viewing. Somebody pointed out that all of the uh, UFO sightings are only happening in uh, North America. And he shows on a map all of the reported sightings, and it's all in North America. And there's a little bit in England, but that's it. So he's trying to figure out why aliens are so racist. Don't you find it weird that the only place that they find UFOs is in America? Here's a map of all the reported UFO sightings in the past hundred years. It's all in America and some in England. Either aliens don't like brown and black people. I'm leaning more towards the idea of racist aliens. Well, I don't know if it's race because, you know, America is a very, it's a big mixing pot of ethnic groups. I would just say maybe it's more nationalist. Maybe it just likes America. Yeah, it could be. Yeah, because, I mean, we we got all kinds of races in America. Yeah. Well, aliens don't care about the other nations then. Yeah. It, it seems like they just wanted where all the money's at. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> maybe the greenbacks are caring about the greenbacks. Yeah, maybe we're paying them and they like, they like being paid. They like all that green. Yeah. It is ironic. I mean, I remember some things in different countries, like there was that red, weird w red circle that was in Turkey. 
And but the, these are just one, two off breaks. I would assume, yeah, the most majority of reports is probably in America. But then again, there may be a lot of reports outside of America, but they don't have the ability to report it or they don't have the technology to film it. Like, I don't know. I mean, everybody has phones all across the world. So why aren't we seeing it in, you know, Russia, China, India? Well, in China, it's probably because they're not allowing that kind of information to propagate. And if it does, it's probably just a hit and a miss, like one, two, three, a couple here and there. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, Russia, I don't know. that they, they don't really have that kind of restriction. It's just something to think about. Why aliens are so racist or nationalist. Yeah, in America, it probably is. Well, some people assume that we have discovered real UAPs and they have reverse engineered it and Americans have just built these UFOs. And so what you're seeing is just an American-made UFO, which came from a reverse engineered real UFO. And America has the funding to make it, the money to make it. So they make these real UFOs and that's why it's in America. That's what some people say. Other people say it's just advanced airplane technology that looks like these shapes. And again, it comes down to money. America has the money to make this stuff. So that's probably why you see it in America. Yeah. But, but then again, you know, China has a lot of money. Yeah, China and Russia both have technology too. I mean, we all know that they're, uh, I can never, not backwards, regenerating. Reverse engineering. Reverse engineering. I don't know why I can never remember that word. They're reverse engineering stuff too. So I, I don't understand. Yeah, maybe they're just, like I was saying, maybe in China, they really monitor their internet. It's the Ch Great Wall of, firewall of China. <laughs> the Great Wall of Xi Jumping. Well, that's the only thing I could think of. There is another thing, which is kind of interesting, slightly random, but I guess if you look like, if you dress like a store manager or a store owner, you can literally walk in there and start taking stuff. Kind of like that ladder idea. Yeah. So there's a video circulating where this guy walks into a uh, fast food restaurant. Looks like um, Domino's or um, it, yeah, I don't know where this is. It's a, some kind of pizza place. And he looks like an owner. So he walks in and he just walks right behind the counter. He starts like messing with stuff. And the employees see him, but they just... And he, he, you know, nods at him and they just continue with their work. Nobody says anything because they think he's the affiliate. Looking into places like I own them. I guess if you've never, I guess who does? Whoever would see the executives, the ones who own the business. Not only that, like it, so it changes so many times. And there's so many faces, and he look, he goes in there, it looks like he's inspecting things, he's moving things around. And you don't want to take a chance of disrespecting a real legitimate owner. I know. So it's a good gimmick. Yeah, and I, literally, you can just get free food. Walk in there, grab some food, make yourself something, and they probably wouldn't stop you because they think, well, so the guy owns the place, so mm -hmm. yeah, he owns my buns. That's it. Now, the manager might, like if the district manager was there or something. Yeah, if you walk in and, the, like, the actual executive was <laughs> just need to walk back up. Yeah, yeah like, there's another guy <laughs> in a suit, and yeah. it's like, oh, we got two suits here. Yeah, I would just, you know, act like I'm blind But you something. already walked in the door, yeah, already I'd, in the back. I'd still act like I'm blind. I'm like, well, this is why I have sunglasses on. I'm, I can't see. <laughs> and start act, and start bumbling around. But yeah, that is pretty interesting for people to have fun with. But I know? guess if you walk in there and you just kind of scope the place out and then you see nobody's there and then you just walk in the back and go through. And uh, yeah, I, maybe if you even have a badge, like a little thing that says, uh, 
district manager or something. Oh, yeah, that would actually be even better, yeah. But I mean, when I in my experience with fast food restaurants, they literally just look like normal Joes. Some of them look like bums. Uh, other ones actually look expensive. They have a suit. They have sunglasses on or something. They just walk in. You can tell that they own the place just by the way they walk. Now, usually they're assisted, though, by the manager on board. Like, they'll walk in with the manager. They're talking to them, they're, and they're talking about stuff. So, you know, it's real because you know your manager, and your manager's talking with them, and they're talking about stuff as yeah. they walk around. He's just not back there grabbing cheeseburgers. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but it's happened, though, sometimes. Where, in my experience, working at, like, Burger King when I was a lot younger uh, and uh, uh, other fast food joints, Culver's and all them, people would come in and unannounced, and and it, it's a surprise inspection. Um, so they walk in, and uh, you don't know them from Adam or Eve. So they're just walking in and doing things. If you guys ever do try anything like that, film it, let us know. Uh, it'd be an interesting thing to put on the show. Yeah, and most employees hate the upper people because, like, oh, they're making us work this many hours, not giving us enough break time. So they're not going to talk to these people. They're not going to talk with them because you don't like them. But as soon as you see them, you're just like, okay. And especially since they have that smug look like they own the place, you're not going to say anything to them. So they're not, they're not the undercover boss at this point. They're actually the overcover boss. They're actually just covering it. Yeah, well, you... If it, if it works for you guys, let us know. That It's interesting because theoretically it should work, just like the ladder. If you come in any place with a ladder, they're just going to let you do whatever you got to do. Yeah, but you're not going to be able to grab sandwiches or meat. No, but you could probably go into Burger King and start installing wireless cameras in there and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's even worse. Yeah, but anyways, it's interesting. If you guys do try it, let us know. Send us the film and... We'll be more than happy to show the world. Case study USA. Yeah. What else you got? Well, in 2022, there was a leaked video from uh, the executives at Disney talking about over Zoom about their uh, quote unquote, according to their words, you can tell this is not supposed to be released to the public, but it got leaked. So somebody in that meeting uh recorded the thing and then put it out there for everybody, which I'm happy they did. It's very interesting. I'm here as a mother of, of two queer children, actually, um, uh, one transgender child um, um, and one pansexual child um, and and also as a leader. We had an open forum last week at 20th where, again, the home of, of really incredible groundbreaking LGBTQIA stories over the years where um, one of our execs stood up and said, you know, we only have a handful of queer leads in our content. And I went, what? I, that can't be true. And I, and I, and I realized, oh, it, it actually is true. We have many, many, many LGBTQIA characters in our stories. And, and, and yet we don't have enough leads um, and narratives in which gay characters just, just get to be characters. Um, and, and not have to be about gay stories. And so um, that's been very eye-opening for me. We just don't allow each other to go back. Last summer, we, we removed all of the um, gendered greetings in relationship to our life skills. So we no longer say ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. Um, we, we've trained, we, we've provided training for all of our, our cast members in, in relationship to that. So now they know it's, it's hello everyone or hello friends. We, we are in the process of changing over those, those recorded messages. And so many of you are probably familiar when we brought the fireworks back to the Magic Kingdom. We no longer say ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, we say dreamers of all ages. And so I love the fact that it's opened up the creativity, the opportunity for our cast members to look at that. On my little pocket of like, you know, proud family, Disney TVA, um, the showrunners were super welcoming, Meredith Roberts and like the, the, our leadership over there has been so welcoming to like my like not at all secret gay agenda. And so like, I, I feel like I felt like it was, I mean, like maybe it was that way in the past, but I guess like something must have happened in the last, like, like they are turning it around, they're going hard. And then all that like momentum that I felt like that sense of, I don't have to be afraid to like, let's have these two characters kiss. Let's in the background, like I was just 
wherever I could, just basically adding queerness to like the, if you see anything queer in the show, I'm proud of But like I, I just was like, no one would stop me and no one was trying to stop me. Yeah, um, I've had the privilege of working with the Moon Girl team for the last two years, and they've been really open to exploring queer stories. And part of, I'm on the production side, uh, part of uh, the work that I feel like I can put in is um, making sure that we take place in modern day New York. So making sure that that's like an accurate reflection of New York. So I put together like a tracker of our background characters to make sure that we have like a, the full breadth of expression and uh, we got into a very similar conversation, Carrie, of like, oh, all of our like gender nonconforming characters are in the background. And so it's not just a numbers game um, of how many LGBTQ plus characters you have. We got the further, uh, the, the more centered a story is on a character, the more nuanced you get to get into their story. And especially with like trans characters, you can't see if someone is trans. There's not one way to look trans. And so kind of the only way to have these like canonical trans characters, canonical asexual characters, canonical bisexual characters is to give them stories where they can like be their whole selves. Disney's corporate president, Carrie Burke said in the company call as the mother of one transgender child and one pansexual child, she wants to make sure Disney includes many, many, many LGBTQIA characters in our stories and wants a minimum of 50% of characters to be LGBTQ and racial minorities. At one point, the executive producer Latoya Ravenel says her team has implemented a not at all secret gay agenda and is regularly adding queerness to children's programming. At one point, this lady actually started talking about her show, uh, The Proud Family. She's like, you know, you'll actually see uh, two lesbians kissing in the background. You'll see, you know, some uh, um, homosexual colors and flag stuff here and there. And she's saying, it. so we are literally every spot we can, we are putting it into every cartoon, anywhere we can. And she actually laughs and she says, that's actually my doing. Like, I'm, I'll take full credit for that. Like, she's trying to be like, she's trying to be a proud family to her superiors. She's showing them her, the work she's done. So she's proud of her production. So this is <clears throat> Edward Bernays 2.0. Yeah, precisely. Mm. The modern propaganda. Yeah. Now, I don't. I know that this story was covered in 2022, but I want to take a second look at the video itself, at least the, the fun segments. It's very interesting because this is Disney. And again, you can tell this is not supposed to be released to the public, but it is. So it's very informative. Whether you are for or against the whole movement, uh, it is interesting to say the least. Well, you know, it's weird to me because I don't care if they utilize these kind of symbologies or not. Everybody has their provocative and they have a right to that. The problem is, yeah, this is Edward Bernays stuff. This is straight propaganda specifically to children. But this isn't even to sell you a product. This is to sell you an ideology. This is to convince you of their religion. And that's what I think is... is is absolutely insane. If you want to propagate something to adults, that's one thing because they have the logical comprehension to distinguish that at, at least as adequate as possible. Children are nothing but copycats. And unfortunately, they don't know really what they're copying. Do it all the time to adults. It's fine. As adults, we have a responsibility to do our own due diligence and responsibility of learning what we are watching, reading, listening to, take as authorities. Children have no comprehension of that. They're just pure copycats. So I, I don't know. Yeah, and they do make it clear this is specifically in children's programs. Specifically in children's programs. And it's, it's not like they don't But know. this is Disney. That's all they specialize yeah, in. The, yeah. This is children programming. Well, there are some adult movies, you know, teen movies, but they actually said specifically, like Proud Family is a specifically children cartoon 
And that's that was one of the many examples. That's the hard thing for me. It's because I don't care. I really don't in my heart. I don't care. Everybody has a right to do whatever makes them happy, and that's fine. As long as you're not hurting nobody, I absolutely don't care. It's just the children is weird. They literally, according to their own words, they created a tracker to make sure that they are creating enough gender nonconforming characters, canonical trans characters, and canonical bisexual characters. So they have a tracker to make sure, like a, a gauge to show, to make sure that they're like, you know, how, again, you go into McDonald's drive through there's a tracker for each car to show how much time they've been at the window. And it, there's a uh, time frame in which you need to get those cars moving. Anybody who's done drive through they know about this. You got to get the cars out as fast as you can, Jim. And uh, so there's a tracker, so to speak. This is the same thing. There's this gauge. It's, it's going to go off if they don't put enough or if they put too much. So they said that at least 50%. So if it goes over 50%, it'll probably go off. If it goes under 50%, it'll probably go off. But they want to have 50% of, uh, of Disney characters be trans, bisexual, uh, gender nonconforming, and racial. And this is probably, well, I'm not even going to say probably, I know for sure. This is all connected with that ESG investing that we were talking about a couple of weeks ago. That environmental social governance initiative that is controlled by the World Economic Forum that I showed you guys that video with BlackRock saying, we are going to change. We are forcing behaviors. Behaviors are going to have to change. And this is one thing we're, going to, we're asking companies. Uh, you have to force behaviors. And at BlackRock, we are forcing behaviors. Because they have to initialize this world conformity. I don't believe that their personal sexual proclivity is what pushes the agenda. It's literally for the sake of controlling people. If they can get you to conform to things like this, they already are training your brain to conform. Don't speak. Don't put opposition. Just obey and conform. What are you going to do about it? You can't do nothing, so it's easier just to submit. And the more they do this, even in children, so if they get you started at a young age and as a child to just practice conformity, when you get old, they can control you to do anything. And so I don't really think this is more or less, a, in the corporate sense, an agenda for sexual proclivity as much as just training people to conform to what the corporations want you to do. And, but yeah, I do think this is directly correlated with ESG. And this is just a derivative of Edward Bernays. And I just think it's absolutely insane that it's specializing towards the children. Yeah, it's sad that they have to... And they're. The only reason, and it's it's obvious to everybody, the only reason they're including what they call racial minorities is that way if you come against this, then that's the shield. So they do, the only reason Disney, the only value that Disney sees in racial minorities is a shield. It's like, you guys will take the bullet for us, okay? Like, they're just throwing the racial minorities in front of the, on the front line. So they will take the bullet. So they Disney can do whatever they want behind the racial minorities and anything that happens the racial minorities are going to take the blow of it then you know you guys could fix this easily as the majority of the public by just simply boycotting you know it'll simply just stop stop watching it if you stop watching it going to the movies because they still they spend billions of dollars on this you stop going to the movies stop watching it you don't uh subscribe to disney plus you stop going to the theme parks they're going to change they don't have a choice because they're going to go bankrupt they're already dealing with financial problems right now because Disney Plus isn't panning out with as much of investment that they put into it. Well, the ESG will still pay them. I mean, they'll still get money from investors. But that only can last so long because investors are about making money, not losing money. And if they keep dumping money into Disney, but there's no return. Well, this is the same thing with Bud Light, which is now becoming Bud Heavy. Yeah, but you're going to see eventually there's going to be a transitional change so they can make money again. I don't think so. I think all these billionaires, this is, again, the whole point of the minor, the racial minority thing, the whole BLM thing. And, and Pete, there's documentaries exposing the truth on where all that billions and billions of dollars went. Uh, and it, it didn't go towards BLM. It actually went towards the LGBTQ+. plus. So they're using the racial minorities to get money even to be a shield to everything. They're literally just stepping on the racial minorities. So that way they could get uh, everything. Disney is trying to siphon as much money from the racial minorities. 
while using them as a shield, while using all that money to promote their agenda still, which what are you going to do? That's where all the money's coming from. At the end of the day, if they don't have shareholders, their economy, their whole business collapse. Institutional investing can uphold the majority of shareholding. If that's the case, well, just transfer from business to business. It's just the way the markets work. At some point, the public has to be involved in shareholdings. If not, well, yeah, then it just changes. It's just like if a large company owns the majority of another company, that company no longer is that company. It belongs to this company. But at some point, that company has shareholders. Everything is derived from some public shareholding at some point. And if people don't like it, all they have to do is stop contributing to that company. Well, if this is the case, then why is Bud Light still going strong, still mocking the people, calling them crybabies? Why is Target doing the same thing? Everybody's doing the same thing. Because and there's more companies, too, like North Face, and all these new companies are actually jumping and saying, you know what, that's a good idea. I want to lose well, money. Well, when you look at the stock market, what you realize is that as much as people are boycotting, everybody needs to put their money somewhere. And the pension funds... Like everybody has a retirement plan. So what do you think the pension funds are putting their money in? You might not be supporting Bud Light or Target or whatever, but the pension funds are going to put their money in there. You don't control where they put the individual investments. So at some point, the stock market is still going to be diversified into these things because ultimately the majority of money is controlled outside of your hands. Because you and I only have so much money, but our retirement, like our 401s or whatever, they're huge sums of money that we can't touch until we're 59, 60, whatever. And somebody is investing all that money. And who is that? It's the states. And they're going to put their money into Target and Bud Light and whoever else that complies with the ESG. And we can't stop that because we continue having these retirement plans. Social Security is diversified. So when you have a Social Security, all that money has to be diversified into some kind of retirement, uh, some kind of allocated investment in the market. So... At some point, the only thing individuals can do is stop supporting it financially. You can say, I'm not going to buy it. I'm not going to do this. And eventually over time. That's what's happening. Yeah, and I know. they're still floating. Well, right now. But it only can last so long. It can't last forever. If people infinitively stop buying Bud Light, yeah, that'd be the end. I'm just looking on Forbes right now, and uh, there's they're saying that it's uh, in a permanent 15% decline, uh, but that doesn't mean it's going to be like that. And it says now may be an attractive time to buy That's stock. That's right. For the pension funds and stuff, they're going to start dumping in yeah. because now it's at a low and now they're going to pump it back up. Well, that's my point. Though. In the end, it doesn't matter then if everybody stops buying Bud Light. They're going to be floating off But if they don't alone. sell any product, it doesn't matter. You can buy all the shares you want if you don't sell the product eventually the company's going to be worth nothing. Well, they only need to sell maybe five beers a month or no, maybe a year. that's not realistic. On a realistic level, you have to create profit. Stocks don't create profit. Your stocks can go to the gazoo if you don't sell any, if you don't have a profit, because they have to report their profit sharing. And that's what, we're, that's what people allocate on what they're going to buy. Because all stocks is is a future assessment of the company. What we think is going to happen in the future. And that's why you buy a stock. If they show that their profits tanked, I guarantee everybody's going to sell that stock. Yeah, they're only saying 15%. Yeah, right now, yeah. And it's probably lucrative right now. Yeah, they're saying like that. It seems like that's what they believe is that's as low as it's going to go. Like that's the, Until, Unless they do something again. Like they do another thing, of course, it's going to have more backlash. And, I, and that's why I don't think they're going to do another thing right now. I think they're going to relax for a while. But eventually, now let's say all companies start complying like this. What are you going to do? Let's say all companies start pushing out this ESG initiative. What is everybody going to do? We're going to stop buying everything. We're going to boycott the planet. And that's when it becomes really problematic. That's almost like digital currency stuff. What are you going to do? How are you going to stop it? Because right now it's Bud Light or Target or something. What happens when it turns into like Walmart? Or it turns into... Yeah, but everybody, it seems like, again, everybody is doing it. That's what I'm saying. No, but Target some people, went down 17%. Some so. people are doing it a lot more radical than other people. And that's the problem. It's like, of course, everybody's doing it. But some people are just doing it in your face. 
and of course, those are the ones that get hit hard. Yeah, but it it shields the ones who are doing it secretly because now. Yeah, maybe so. Maybe like maybe that's the maybe, maybe they're just uh, watch my left hand so you can see the yeah, right hand. They're stretching it so far that to go back to normal, it's like well, you have all this gap. They stretch it so far out. Normal could be anywhere within this. Yeah, that, that's actually a possibility. You got these shields. Big company shield, so you don't see what the other companies are doing. It's possible. Shout out to Avengers, the shield. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I guess I didn't think about that, but that's possible. Yeah, yeah Target I mean, and all of them could be just shields. You know, the shield in the Avengers is ran by a minority, too. Is it? I, yeah. I'm not very familiar with that. He's a he's a handicap because he's one eye. He has one eye. He's a handicap uh, minority. His company's name is Shield. That could be a very plausible thing that's happening. The big comp- These bigger companies that they take the blunt like target or budweiser while you don't see what walmart's doing and you don't see what blackrock's doing and you don't see what all these other companies that probably have a larger influence and because you're paying attention too much to target and but like that that could be a true thing yeah but anyways whatever we're seeing the only thing that we can do as a as a society is stop buying their products but that really is that old problem because i remember back in the 90s and the early 2000s Everybody was against Procter & Gamble because they thought it was like satanic or something. But they made such good quality products. Eventually, everybody stopped the boycott because what are you going to do? You need to buy those high quality products. And so, yeah, did this be, but those are high utility products like deodorant, uh, toothpaste, shampoo, things like that. You, we're talking about entertainment like Disney. You don't have to utilize Disney's entertainment. So that is something that you could literally stop and not have that much of a detrimental impact. But anyways, that's the only thing that uh, I think that we could feasibly do, but it's probably not going to stop anything. ESG is going to continue propagating. It's going to continue taking over. And now you're seeing what's happening. And unfortunately, it's affecting the children. That That's the real difficult part. So no, take it for what it is, but... Anyways, that's all the time we have for this episode. We hope that it was insightful, intriguing, jam-packed. You got something out of it. Join us for our lives. We broadcast our live every week right after this, so every Thursday afternoon. Um, Join us on the Discord. And listen to us on all the audio podcast platforms from Spotify, Apple iTunes, Google Podcasts, CastBox, all of them. Also... If you guys would like to help contribute to help us continue uh, producing these broadcasts, we don't really get monetized much because a lot of our video gets demonetized. You can always think about joining the membership, the Toilet Timers membership. There's a little join button right at the bottom of our video, and you can help us continue publicizing these videos, contributing to exposing the illusions of the Matrix here. So consider joining a part of Toilet Time TV and become a Toilet Timer today. If you become a member, we'll love you like our own mothers. Anyways, Eagle Eye says... Hello. Goodbye. (laughs) Alice says farewell. Colleague says... Adios. And I say... See you next time. So, from the family here at Toilet Time TV, we'll see you next time here in the Toilet Zone. Auf Wiedersehen.